Joy, I want to commend you on your outstanding accomplishments as president superintendent and for the leadership you provided during your tenure. You assumed command just about the time the bloom was off the lily for community colleges in California. I know how difficult it was for you to maintain a steady course when faced by so many demanding interests. And personally, may I thank you for your thoughtfulness in keeping me aware of the college's progress over these many years. Keep in touch and stay healthy. Good luck, Reva and Bill Richter. Bill was the second president of Ohlone College. Okay, the classified Senate president, uh, Cindy Katona, is going to make a presentation. No, wait, no. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry about that. I can't read your handwriting I here. It's my, <laughs> I, my handwriting is there. On, uh, there's a slight change in the program. Connie Tashara, would you come on up, please? <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Blumman, on behalf of the Classified Senate, and in recognition of your many years of service to Ohlone College, we would like to bestow upon you this honor, and, and we thank you very much for, for the years of service you've given to us. Thank you. The next letter, I ask if I could read this one because it comes from a friend of mine also. It says, Dear Peter, I want to offer my congratulations to a fellow survivor and to predict that you really, really will enjoy the freedom from pressure and decisions. It's been 13 years since I left Chabot College and though I miss many, many friends, I must confess the turmoil of finance and personnel are easily displaced. Again, our congratulations. If your journey ever brings you to the Valley of the Moon, we'd love to have you stop by. Warmest regards, Reed and Elaine Buffington. And now Cindy Katona would come forward for the Faculty Senate. It's a great honor uh, to be here tonight representing the faculty and the classified folks <laughs> um, in, <laughs> in celebrating uh, Dr. Blomerly's retirement. Uh, when great things happen at a community college, there are always a lot of people involved in getting them to happen. In the 15 years that Dr. Blomerly has been president, many great things have happened at Ohlone College. I'd like to tell you about a few of them. I know Dr. Blomerly would not personally take credit for any of these things, but I think it's also important that they happened on his watch. During the time that he was president, Ohlone College added Gallaudet Western Regional Center. It established an international education program and a semester abroad in Stratford-upon-Avon. The College for Kids was established. Contract Ed was established. KOHL, our radio, was relocated and expanded program and power. Telephone registration was implemented. The Newark Ohlone Center was established. We were successfully accredited for the maximum period of time. Funding for major new building, the Center for Fine and Performing Arts was completed. There was an establishment of the Ohlone College Foundation, and now we have the Foundation Roundtable with major programming and fundraising activities. The flea market was implemented to provide supplemental funding for the campus, and we have made significant progress in affirmative action. I believe 
that all of these things owe a great deal to Dr. Blomerly, and we'd like to thank him for those things. The Senate also would like to present Dr. Blomerly with this resolution, which also has all the appropriate whereases. And in addition to that, uh, we commissioned a video, a farewell to Dr. Peter Blomerly, in which um, faculty and staff and everyone had an opportunity to say goodbye personally. So, thank you. And I'd like to have Stacy Cole, representing the faculty, also come forward, please. <laughs> no, Dan, he really isn't that good, you know, truth, <laughs> truth to tell. For those who are not members of the Ohlone family as such, and that includes many of you who have joined us tonight to uh, bid farewell, in a sense, to this fine couple, uh, I want you to know that we put this little performance on deliberately so that you would know why Dr. Blomerly is taking retirement a little earlier than he might otherwise do. <laughs> because the people who were in this are the best and brightest and most talented people <laughs> that we have on our faculty and our staff. The rest of us are somewhat retarded in contrast to these people. He's not known for moving very rapidly, but I tell you, the fastest I've seen him move in 15 years was when he tried to reach out and grab that clock. <laughs> that was a good move. And I want to thank Dan and the group for including the gratuities on that thing, because I'm thanking you on behalf of the people at Pebble Beach for that regard. <laughs> oh, boy. Claire Booth Luce, and if you know who Claire Booth Luce was, that dates you, and I can look around and see a lot of people in this room who will know who Claire Booth Luce was. <laughs> Claire Booth Luce once said of Franklin Roosevelt, and a lot of you won't even know who Franklin Roosevelt was, <laughs> that he was two-thirds Eleanor and one-third mush. <laughs> no one would ever associate the word mush with Peter Blomerly. And I know that he's not two-thirds Barbara. But anybody who knows, Dr. Blomerly knows there's a lot more there than meets the eye in almost every situation. He's a very complicated, very complex person, controlled, disciplined, uh, and there's always more than what you see there. And anybody who knows Barbara knows that a good part of what is there that you don't see is his wife, Barbara, and I think we ought to give her a round of applause. I told him, and I was not joking, that he can go, but Barbara has to stay. <laughs> My 97-year-old stepmother always categorized people like she did the fabric that she worked on. She was an accomplished seamstress, and she would say of some woman, now that's a, that's a woman's fine cloth there. And she'd see some man and, and get to know him, say, that's a coarse weave. That's a coarse weave. <laughs> Well, if she had known Barbara Blomley, she would know that that's a fine piece of cloth, vivid, colorful, warm, and gracious. If she had have known Peter Blomley, long as we've known Peter Blomley, she would have known that he was sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> Fifteen years, we got the same story from him, either at the end of the year or at the first year, and if we were very fortunate, we got it both times. <laughs> the state of the state and the state of the institution. I always used to call it his pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will routine. <laughs> Intellectually, he knew things were going to hell in a handbasket, and uh, optimistically, in terms of the will, he knew that somehow we were going to get through it together. And it was through his experience that we got through it, and experience and good judgment. And as the saying goes, you get good judgment from experience and you get experience from bad judgment. And somewhere back down the line, this man had a lot of bad judgment. <laughs> His marriage was probably the first really good thing he ever did here. 
but by the time he reached the loney college his good judgment and his experience served us admirably because as everyone in this room is aware the state and the college education in general public services in general much of what made california golden has tarnished a bit and he had to work with the hand that was dealt him and he worked with it very well indeed there's a a kind of uh, Hebraic uh, Christian uh, word that describes Dr. Blomley, and he and I come from a similar background, a world apart, and personalities, thank goodness, a world apart. <laughs> but uh, we will both understand this word, and it's called stewardship. And when that word is used in the Holy Writ, it has a special meaning. It's one of the highest and most favorable terms that can be applied to anyone, that they were a good steward. Dr. Blomerley, you've been a good steward with all that means, and that encompasses a world of symbolic and actual meanings. I think above all else, I will quote that great American philosopher Yogi Berra. He said, never make the wrong mistake. <laughs> and this man never made the wrong mistake. Now, he made a lot of mistakes, but he never made the wrong mistake. <laughs> and all over the state, publicly and privately, people were making the wrong mistake. And he kept us on track. We never made the wrong mistake. Early in the century, the great philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said that those who study culture do well to study those things that the culture never really talks about, that people never get around to talking about. Because those are the things that are taken for granted. Those are the unstated uh, axioms and so on, by which the culture lives. And in 37 years in this profession, I've worked with a lot of people. And I don't know that I've ever worked with an individual about whom more could be taken for granted than Dr. Blomerley. And that's saying a great deal. When you can take something for granted, you know, people say, don't take me for granted. That's not always, you're not always paying a compliment to someone when you say, don't take me for granted. When you say, you can take me for granted, you're really saying, what you know me to be is what you can count on me being. And it's not always bad to be taken for granted. And we could take Dr. Blomley for granted. We knew his qualities. And long after he leaves, it will be that that we will think about is how many things we took for granted with this man. He did not always receive his due. Well, tonight we're giving him his due, and then some. We, we wish you well, and I've already told him that wherever he goes, I'm going to come and freeload off of him. And he has said that I have an open invitation, and he doesn't think that I'm going to do that because I'm known to sometimes make promises I do not keep. But this time, I'm keeping it. Wherever you go, one of these days, there's going to be a knock on your door, and I'm going to be there. Thank you. To save Ken Waters from following Stacy immediately, I wanted to read a little bit from another letter. Um, this is from John Baker, who served at Ohlone College for years. Uh, my new position at College of Alameda has not been easy. And yet I was well prepared because of your example and the support you provided me with during the time I got to work with you at Ohlone College. Your leadership skills, the way you carried yourself, all were helpful as I developed my own style. I saw you grow and I saw you learn. You brought the college through some very difficult times and it was your vision that allowed the ship to remain steady during some very turbulent moments. I could go on. Let me simply say that I am a richer person for knowing you, and I wish you and Barbara the very best as you step on to other new ventures. Have a joyful holiday. Know that you are loved. Agape, John Baker. And representing the administrators group, uh, you can all provide the words you'd like to Ak Messiah, uh, Ken Waters. I did it on purpose, I did it on purpose. <laughs> Many of you probably could not see where I was seated. 
And I was seated at the table where you see that horse. <laughs> and what I'd like to announce is that's not a boy horse. And that horse, while sitting there, decided to have a little colt, which I have here. <laughs> so I guess that means, Dr. Blomerly, that you're also going to have to become a horse trainer. Because this little colt here is a little gift that we, as a part of the management and supervisors and confidential group, would like to present to you. This is indeed a pleasure, and one we hope that you will... Well, I took the horse, by the way, to the taxidermist and, and got it petrified. And <laughs> this is uh, known as a putter. Now, Tony Cardinelli uh, took the time and trouble to select this, get this engraved, and let me read it quickly to you. It says, to Peter Blomerly, with appreciation, Ohlone College, Akmasia. It is of 18 karat gold. It has hickory, and I don't know that other thing that Tony told me about. I know, though, that this is made of leather, and you can use it. It looks good. Um, and I invite all of you at the end to take an opportunity to look at it because we of the group of managers and supervisors and confidentials are extremely happy that we can bestow upon you this small token of our appreciation and we wish you and your wife the very best and best of luck to all of you. I'd like to call Ann Golseth, who is the Vice President of, Business, of Student Services and the Senior Vice President at the college. Not the oldest, the senior. Thank you, Jim. That, that's a pleasure. It's difficult enough to compete with Stacy Cole, but to compete with a gold putter, uh, that, that's hard. Last week, the uh, students presented to President Blarmerly a, um, a book of articles and pictures from the student newspaper, The Monitor, pictures and articles over the years. And they also found some pictures of me, which they presented to me gleefully as a kind of historical treasure. And I noticed some similarities of the pictures of Peter and me, which appeared in the 80s, particularly the early 80s, when we were much more newsworthy than we are now. Those were times of trials and many difficult decisions at Ohlone. Peter and I looked about the same age. I say that to make him feel good. <laughs> we both had dark hair, stern and worried expressions, and a demeanor of accountability. There have been a few recent photos of both of us, and the change is remarkable. We both look more relaxed, younger, almost pleasant. <laughs> our hair and our demeanors have lightened up. <laughs> lightened up with silver. For me, working with Peter Blomerly has been an experience of learning, of support, of growth, of gratification. We have always worked together, not always in agreement, but we've always been in alignment for the good of the college, its students, and its mission. When Peter came to Ohlone, I did wonder about working with a mathematics type, a New York Britisher, conservative sailor. <laughs> and he may have wondered about working with an English literature type, Midwesterner feminist backpacker. I do think that we began to read some of the same articles. I began to intentionally use such words as add up, equation, coefficient, formula, calculation, and even bottom line. <laughs> and he began to intentionally use such words as feeling, perspective, <laughs> relationship, intuitive. We traveled some difficult roads in the 80s. Some days our choices were among only negative or problematic alternatives. Of first concern for Peter were students and their educational goals. As I walk the Ohlone campus today, I'm struck with the positive changes through these times of hardship, changes that are a tribute to Peter Blomerly and all who served with him. The radio tower, the outside elevator and bridge, the emerging fine and performing arts center, the clean and maintained pool and gymnasium, 
the many new trees and lights and concrete stairs, the good roads and parking lots, the entrance flowers, and thank goodness, the marquee. <laughs> the more important, the less apparent changes are those within the college, its programs, its services, its people. These are changes of growth, of breadth, of diversity, of preservation, of innovation, and of possibility. I believe that colleges have lives and live as we do with ages and with chapters. Peter Blarmerly came to Ohlone as the college was completing its childhood and entering the tumultuous years of youth. He guided the college during these years through many challenges and difficulties, and the college has emerged with greater strength and maturity from these Blarmerly years. Like commencement, this is the end of one chapter and the beginning of another for Peter and Barbara and for Ohlone. I have been very fortunate to be a reader and no doubt a character and certainly a learner in this chapter of the college. For tonight, I did search my Bartlett's for an appropriate quotation, perhaps from Euclid or Newton or from Whitehead or Churchill or Hutchins. And I found many, but I chose instead to rephrase an oath taken by the young people of Athens upon reaching their adulthood. And it goes like this. We will ever strive for the ideals and sacred things of our college. Both alone and with many, we will unceasingly seek to quicken the sense of student, staff, and faculty responsibility. We will revere and pursue the college goals. We will transmit this college not only same, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. As he begins a new chapter, Peter Blomerly transmits Ohlone College greater, better, and more beautiful. Thank you, Peter. And now for the big event, Dr. Peter Blomerly will make some remarks. Thank you very much. Wow, I don't expect to, that they'll say such nice things about me until they write my obit. <laughs> it, has, uh, it has been fun to listen to all these things. I want to introduce two people to you. Uh, I, someone arranged to pick me up in a uh, limo tonight. And when I climbed in the limo, I found in the seat there my son and daughter. My son Michael is from Akron, Ohio. My daughter Vicki is from Rochester, New York. And I had no idea they were coming. And I will tell you that as these things have been said, I've been watching their faces. They don't recognize their dad in what has been said. <laughs> but I want them to stand up and have you recognize them. Right now, I feel a little bit like the turtle on a fence post. And you know, when you see a turtle on the fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> but I do, I do want to thank you all for being here. I, actually, I have mixed feelings. I, I'm not sure how I feel about so many people being so happy to come here and see me go. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for being here. It's uh, certainly an event I'm going to treasure uh, for the rest of my life. I actually, I, I didn't see the program before I came. I, this was all kept a great secret from me. I don't know how Barbara and my staff managed and the committee managed to do so much and keep it so secret from me. I knew there was a party and I kept asking, will anybody come? And Pat kept saying, sure, don't worry about it. Uh, but apart from that, I, and so I didn't know that I was to make any remarks, but 
I did take a precaution, just in case it should happen to me, I, I picked up uh, the remains of my graduation speech, actually. <laughs> I, didn't get, I didn't get to finish it, so I thought maybe you'd like to hear the rest of it. <clears throat> actually, this business of getting old is kind of interesting. It, it's not at all like you thought it was or would be when you get there, but it, you know, it, it does come home to you over the years that you are getting old and you begin to think about things right, retire like retirement. And actually, I began to think about retirement some months ago when I suspected that my wife was beginning to lose her hearing. <laughs> now, you know, this is a sensitive subject. Some people associate losing hearing with getting old, so you don't like to take it on frontally, and I didn't either. So I consulted a friend of mine who happens to be an audiologist, and I explained uh, what I thought the problem was to him, and he said, no problem. If you stop in my office, I have a little simple test which I can give you to ascertain whether Barbara's losing a hearing or not. And if she is, we can do something about it. He said, stop in for a few minutes. So I did. And he just checked the level of my spoken voice. And after he had done that, he said, now, I want you to go home. And I want you to uh, catch Barbara in a situation where she's not aware that you're there. And speak to her. So try this from 25 feet away, and then if she doesn't answer, try it from 12 feet away. And if she still doesn't answer, then just get closer. And when this is over and she finally hears you, you come back and let me know what the distance was, and I can give you, uh, I can give you an answer to your question about her hearing. So I did. I, shortly thereafter, I found her working out in the garden. She had her back to me. So I stood about 25 uh, feet away, and I said, Barbara, what time is it? No answer. So I followed his advice. I stepped up to about 12 feet away from him, and I said, Barbara, what time is it? Still no answer. Well, I was getting worried. I figured by now that I was right. She was losing her hearing. So I stepped up right behind her, and I said, Barbara, what time is it? Whereupon she stood up and turned around and said, Peter, for the third time, it's 3.15. <laughs> Well, I, I would be remiss if I let this, uh, this slip by without thanking the people who put this on. You've got the list of the committee, and I won't read it, but I want to sincerely thank everybody on the committee who had a hand in this. And I particularly want to thank the crowd from my office, because it's been hectic, and uh, I know it's been a lot of work. They were working right up until the last minute this afternoon on something in the back room. Uh, but I want to acknowledge particularly Pat Dagelman, uh, who was in the skit. I won't tell you which one, but she was there. Uh, she is our office manager. Inga Bellamy from our office and uh, Kathy Tansley. And I'd also like to thank Winnie Vales, who is in the foundation office and also had quite a hand in this. You know, I've, uh, I've sat where you are a lot of times uh, in retirement functions, and I've even given remarks occasionally. Uh, on behalf of the college, recognizing the contributions of retirees. And I, I have to uh, confess that I've read some pretty bad jokes in my time when I've gone to those. You know, things, that, things like I feel, things like, uh, you know, you are growing old when you feel like the morning after, the night before, and you haven't even been anywhere. Uh, there are lots of signs along the way. Your back goes out more than you do. Uh, everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. A gleam in your eyes is from your bifocals. Uh, one of my favorites is, uh, you know you're growing old when you can sing and brush your teeth at the same time. <laughs> Another one is, uh, you know you're growing old when you look forward to a dull evening. And you know, the scary thing is that really happened to me last week. <laughs> Well, I, I promise never to tell jokes like that again. Uh, actually, I kind of enjoy jokes, even though I'm an Englishman. You know, uh, an Englishman enjoys a joke three times. We're not known for our humor. Uh, he, he enjoys it once when he hears it, and the second time when you explain it to him, and thirdly, when he gets it. <laughs> but in any event, I promise never to tell those kind of jokes again. Uh, Somehow they seem more serious to me than they used to. <laughs> but 
I want to acknowledge uh, here this evening that public education has really been good to me. And uh, many of you I know have participated in public education. Some of you know my story. I've given it before, but it bears repeating, I think, because I did really come to this country as a foreign student at the age of 17 on my own. And pretty much I uh, was on my own from that point uh, through and could not possibly have made it had it not been for American public education and its opportunities. Those opportunities are still there, possibly even better than they were in those days. I've graduated from a public university. I graduated from a private university. But even in the latter case, I did it on a public fellowship. So it's been good for me. It's uh, enabled me to get through life. It's it's provided a career for me as well as an education and it's enabled me to put food on the table and it enables me to stand here this evening and I'd like to acknowledge that. I hope that all of you continue to support what is one of the greatest public education systems in the country, the public higher education system of the state of California. I'd also like to recognize again all of you who are here, it, I guess you come to a point in life where you realize as you, that people are what really matter. And as I look around, there are so many memories uh, associated with the people that I see here in the, in the audience. As I look at each one of you, there's a story that goes with that part of my life. And I really thank you for being part of my life. Finally, I know you don't want to stand, stay here for the rest of the evening, so I will, I'll put aside what I brought and just finish up. But it seems to me that when you come to an occasion like this, uh, you deserve more, to go home with more than just the indigestion that you'll carry with you. And so I'm going to leave with you a bit of philosophy. And this is the story that took place, that takes place in Africa. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. So it doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you'd better be running. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is so out of order, but we just missed calling Don Amsbaugh from the Ohlone College Foundation up. Don. Thank you, Jim. It's a little anticlimactic after that. Uh, don't want to keep you too long, but someone reminded me while I was here this evening. Charlie Brown, the comic strip Peanuts, was sitting on the curb somewhat dejectedly. He said, you know, doing a good job around here is like wetting your pants in a dark suit. <laughs> it gives you a warm feeling, but no one notices. Peter, that's not true with you. <laughs> People notice you and appreciate you. And on behalf of the Lonely College Foundation, who joined me in thanking you for your leadership and support of the foundation during your term as president of the Lonely College, your leadership, your commitment to excellence has really been an inspiration for others to follow. And it's created an atmosphere for the foundation to grow and flourish in its formative years. And the mission of the Ohlone College Foundation is to provide resources to enhance educational and cultural opportunities and to promote excellence at Ohlone College. And Peter, taking this up, made a major effort to select and encourage major donors for the foundation. And it's only fitting and appropriate that the first donor, major donor, is a member of our faculty, Dr. Gary Smith and his wife, who made a contribution of $1.1 million 
to start the endowment fund for the performing arts. This was quickly followed by a second contribution of $350,000 from Bonnie Jackson in memory of her late husband, Craig Jackson, who was also a member of the faculty. And I'd like to acknowledge those people this evening. And Peter, I really don't want to take the spotlight away from you, but these are important people, <clears throat> which is why I wanted to recognize them at this time. In addition to this, while Peter was president of the, of the college, we embarked upon a plan and he was instrumental in setting forth the Ohlone College round table, business roundtable, which has become the largest and most prestigious quality assurance program on the West Coast. Other functions that have ensued from the foundation have been the breakfast forum, which attracts renowned speakers from around the area, the benefit luncheon, which recognizes individuals who have made extraordinary contributions for the benefit of the community. And this year, our honorees will be Dan and Marie Archer over there. <laughs> Dr. Blomley is admired and respected throughout the entire Fremont Newark College District as you've heard this evening. It is a pleasure and a privilege to have known you, Peter, and I really count you and think very thankful to have you as a friend. Thank you very much. Dr. Blomerly, you may remember each uh, year, or at least 10 out of the 22 years I've been here, you've only been here 15, but Dan Archer, Dan Archer would always say, tell a, a joke. And uh, then he would yell to me out in the audience and say, hey Maggie, is that a good Kentucky joke? And my friends were always surprised. They said, well Maggie, you're not from Kentucky, you don't have an accent. Well, tonight, for Dan Etcher, I'm going to do this for you. And if I were to use my southern accent, and many pearls just lived over in Tennessee, you know, we would say, Dr. Blomerly, we love you, honey, and we all want you to come back. You hear? <laughs> We have a present for you, and I'm going to open it for you. <laughs> we do things crazy down there in Kentucky. This is a little message center from Jim and me, and it's for you to put in your office, and then when Barbara wants to leave your little message, she goes in, and then she picks up your little talking egg. <laughs> and she can leave you a little message. So we have a little message here for you. And all you do is pull your little string. <laughs> we'll do it again. I'm not sure that was polite. <laughs> it works when you hold the thing down. What, we, what Jim and I are saying to you is that it is an honor for us to have been part of this for you and that we think you're a real good egg. <laughs> And good night, and thank all of you for coming, too. And as many Pearl would say, howdy.
Thank Love you very much. Oh, now it's working. Oh, the egg's working.